Good morning. It's lovely to see you. Uh, my name's Tim Stratford, the Dean at this Cathedral, so a really warm welcome to you from the Cathedral community today. Uh, we're expecting more who have booked in to arrive over the course of the morning, and there may well be people who drop in as well. Uh, can you hear me well enough? I can sense my voice is sort of echoing everywhere, but um, you will need to bear with us uh, a little uh, through this. We closed, as everywhere did, over COVID. Uh, we're still opening up. This is the first time since COVID that we have tried uh, a, a, a teaching day of any sort. Uh, and uh, half of our staff have never seen the cathedral open and running before. We've got a whole uh, set of new kit, uh, which we're hoping is going to work uh, through the whole of the day. Um, so please do bear with us. You are guinea pigs. Uh, and apologies if things go wrong. Uh, but you are most welcome. Uh, the, the exhibition that uh, has inspired this teaching day, uh, I hope you've had chance to see, if you've not had chance to look at the pieces that are here, there are spaces in the day, uh, use those spaces. Uh, it's an attempt to uh, remind those of us in particular um, who have grown up in the faith uh, with white Western European eyes that God is not a white Western European. Um, uh, and uh, it's an attempt to look at Jesus through other cultural eyes as well and to gain a bigger picture uh, of our creator and of who Jesus was. Uh, I've found what's been assembled here to be very powerful and really grateful to Jeremy and the team who have pulled this together. Uh, looking forward very much uh, to hearing more through other cultural perspectives uh, in the course of this day. Um, I'll just say one or two practical uh, things uh, about Chester Cathedral for you. And then I'm going to hand over to Ian Bishop, um, who I think it's fair to say, Ian, the initial inspiration for this um, came out of a throwaway comment you put into the Bishop's staff meeting some year, and a, well, it may not have been a throwaway comment, uh, 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 a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, Ian will hold this day together for us. Uh, but... Uh, and, and I must say, apologies to those of you who are joining us online uh, for these very domestic uh, notices now. It is good that we have you with us as well. Those of you in person, uh, this day is being recorded on YouTube. Uh, and if you want to hear again anything that's said, you can go to the YouTube stream and follow it there. Uh, but for some very domestic notices, that coffee is not far away. Our apologies that we did not begin with coffee, uh, a little bit of learning for us, and that's been added to the checklist for next time. Uh, we're not charging for the day, but I'm afraid we will need to charge for refreshments, in, just in the normal way that Chester uh, Cathedral does. So refreshments will be available in the refectory. The refectory know when our breaks are, and they are going to try their best uh, to uh, serve you quickly and promptly. Fingers crossed. That's not always been a strength since we've been reopening. Um, lunchtime... It would help the refectory if you wanted sandwiches, if in the coffee break you pre-ordered uh, your sandwiches. You'll get them quicker at lunchtime if you do that. Uh, the refectory's been extremely busy over this half-term week uh, at lunchtime, so that's a way of getting ahead of the queue. Otherwise, you may be at the back of the queue. Uh, also at lunchtime, there is an organ recital which starts at ten past one. I think we're aiming to finish the morning session at about 10 to 1. Uh, so that should be 20 minutes to pick up your sandwiches. If you want to come back for the organ recital, uh, please do. Uh, but if you want to enjoy the fresh air or look at some of the images in the exhibition, then feel free to do that as well. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, toilets, shall I do those practical things? Um, toilets uh, go to the very back of the cathedral through the cloister door and they're at the end of that corridor. Uh, we're not expecting a fire alarm today, so if the fire alarm goes off, we will need to leave. Uh, masks, we um, ask when you are moving about the building, please, that you wear a, a mask when the public are in. Um, you uh, make your own judgment when you're sitting down, and you may want to just check out with your neighbours uh, whether to wear masks or not when you're sitting down. It can be a long time to be wearing masks all day. But please, when you move about, uh, do so. I think that's all I need to say. Uh, over to you, Ian. Thank you very much. Well, a very good morning to you all. It's lovely to see you, and, uh, and particularly a good welcome to everybody who's watching us on the YouTube channel. Uh, it's, uh, it, this is, this, as Tim said, this, this has sort of emerged, and uh, I would particularly want to uh, thank everybody at the cathedral for all that they've done in putting this, this really lovely exhibition together that I, I hope, if you haven't had a chance to see it, you will get a chance to see it. We've deliberately built space into the day so that people have got time to enjoy the, the exhibition and indeed the, the cathedral itself, which is a lovely space anyway. Um, what we hope will come through this is, is, is very much a chance for people to reflect on something that has been really important, I think, in the life of our world. Uh, the, uh, the killing of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter campaign that, that followed that, really raised, I think, the issues for Western white Christianity. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a privilege to work with the Race and Ethnicity Forum in our own diocese, trying to think how we respond to that. And this exhibition has been part of that response, and today's teaching day is equally part of that response. And the fact that it's available on YouTube, and I know that there are going to be quite a lot of people who couldn't be here today, who are going to be here at least dipping in and out as their, their duties uh, re uh, allow them, so that there is going to be a lot of people, even though it may feel we're small in the cathedral, there's going to be a lot of people engaging with this through the day and subsequently. Uh, I particularly want to thank our speakers for coming. Uh, we've got uh, Cham Korman, who will hear, hear more from them and more about them as, uh, as we come to, together, and Shamal Matthew and Calvin Samuel, they're here sitting in the front row, and we're really delighted, and thank you. Thank you very much for coming today. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. This is Black History Month, and uh, that's kind of the main reason why we, we wanted to really focus on this issue uh, at this time. It's a, Black History Month has been observed since 1987, but I think this year it's got a, a particular resonance for obvious reasons. It celebrates and, uh, and honours the struggles of people from the global majority heritage and uh, recognize, it wants to recognise the, the part that they have played in uh, our society and in global society. But I think as well it's about lamenting and remembering the black voices that perhaps have been overlooked or marginalised and we want to encourage an awareness of, uh, 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 of black culture in this country and around the world, particularly within our church. And so as we start today, we're going to start with prayer and a time of reflection together. So can I just encourage you just to close your eyes. I'm going to lead us in some prayers. But as I do, I hope and pray that you will hold in your hearts all those that you know who perhaps have, had the, have been marginalized, those who've been overlooked or not listened to. God of our salvation, you've created the people of the world in your own image. Give us grace, we pray, to rejoice in the differences of culture 
language and race by which you have enriched humanity. To repent when we fail to recognize Christ in one another and to pursue justice and peace for all your children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taking our human nature, accepted death upon the cross and lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and for eternity. Amen. I'm going to lead us in some intercessionary prayers as well. When I say the words, Lord, in your mercy, will you respond, please? Hear our prayer. God of all peoples, whose Son reached across the ethnic boundaries between Samaritan, Roman, and Jew, help us to break down the barriers in our communities. Enable us to see the reality of racism and bigotry and free us to challenge and uproot it from ourselves, our society, and our world. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all victims of racial hatred and discrimination, and we seek your protection for those affected in our churches, our schools, our places of work, and our communities. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all in our world, of whatever race, who suffer the horrors of modern slavery. Your Son came to bring good news to the poor and freedom for the oppressed. And so we pray for all working to combat modern slavery and to end human trafficking. For governments and agencies, for church and other faith leaders, for businesses, charities and individuals seeking to be the change. Lord, in your mercy... We pray for ourselves. May we be voices against oppression and channels of the transforming power of the gospel. Open our hearts to all who suffer in our midst but out of sight. Help us to work for a world where human beings are valued, where no one is enslaved and no one used against their will for another's pleasure or need. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that we may know the power of reconciliation wherever there is division between us and others because of our race or ethnicity. We pray that we may all be led to reconciliation. We pray for all who work to bring communities together in ways that are just and equal for all. Lord, in your mercy. As we pray for reconciliation, we pray also for restoration. We pray for those whose spirits and communities have been weighed down by racism. Guide us as we strive to ensure everyone has equal dignity. Lord, in your mercy. And a prayer of lament. God of all, we confess that we have inherited a faith that was used to justify the theft of native lands and the enslavement of your people. From this sin, we ask for deliverance. Touch hearts that have been shriveled by generations of suppressed empathy and eyes that have lost the ability to see brothers and sisters who suffer from systematic injustice. Grant us courage to renounce the false teaching that we can somehow know you without being committed to justice for all people. In your mercy, help us mourn the divisions among the body of your Son and work for healing in the places where we gather to worship you. As we name and unlearn the habits of racism, discrimination and prejudice, Give us grace to draw deeply from the witness of the movements that have always resisted injustice in the power of your Spirit. And we pray with thanksgiving for the prophetic leaders who guide, challenge, and inspire us today. Give us grace to follow them to freedom. 
God of love, you created all human beings in your image and likeness. Bearing your image, you call on us to reflect your goodness, justice, and love to all the world. Remind us of our call to follow your Son and to speak out for justice, mercy, and compassion. As we come before you in prayer today, teach us. Teach us to respect your image in all human beings and help us to defend your image in all human beings. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we draw our prayers together in the family prayer of the church. We say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, the Reverend Shamal Matthew. Only moved house yesterday. Poor man. He's left Becky, his wife, sorting out the boxes. Uh, so, Becky, if you're watching, we apologize for dragging Shamal over here today. Uh, Shamal has been recently appointed as the Vice Dean of Emmanuel Theological College. Uh, he was born and raised in Kerala, in India, in the Christian church that uh, descended from the Apostle Thomas, of course. He's got wide experience of working with Anglican Communion churches in Asia and Africa, and has worked as a teacher in Sri Lanka as well. And I believe you're also General Secretary of the Anglican Minority Ethnic Network, uh, amen, which is, which is great. So, Shamal, it's great to have you with us. Can we welcome Shamal, and we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you very much. One of the things that gone missing in the packing boxes is my watch. So I am using my mobile phone as a watch, but it is on aeroplane mode, so it shouldn't beep. That's the plan. Anyway... Thank you so much for the welcome and thank you for the amazing prayers. So if, uh, if we can have the next slide, please. I'm used to having the clicker, so I'll pretend to click. It's like, you know, look, teaching somebody to drive. You keep pressing the wrong side. Okay, what we are trying to do today is that I would like to start with a little bit about my story and then... Now, UK, what is the context? We're going to think about the context of UK uh, as it is now. And I am going to move a little bit up so that I can see the slide for a second. And define, you look at defining oneself and you look at the theology, both is informed and transformed by context. Uh, how contextual theology is developed and then we will look at the vision and hope for the future. That is kind of the overall plan for the day. I would like to start with, start with my story, if I can have the next slide. Um, uh, I will, uh, as uh, Archdeacon said, I was born in Kerala in the tradition of St. Thomas, so it is believed that Thomas the Apostle came to Kerala and uh, converted a whole lot of families, and we descended from those uh, uh, ancestors. So our church been going on since AD 52. So there is a big chart in our, uh, in our family homes, which got all of us in it. So we have a gathering every five years, around uh, 6,000 of us gather in one of our Syrian Orthodox church, uh, which is our ancestral home church. Uh, but my grandfather uh, converted to be an Anglican because he helped to translate the Bible. And he also helped it also helped him 
because he got all the good jobs. Uh, because uh, all my cousins call us rice Christians because we converted our tradition to get good jobs. So he became a tea planter. His brother uh, became the principal of the CMS college, which is the college first college in South India. And then uh, his brother became the first bishop of church of South India in our diocese. So yeah, we all got good jobs. So that is our background. And the next thing is that I am very, very dyslexic. I do five languages, but I'm, I can't spell in any of them. Uh, that's the reason why I'm standing here with no notes, because I can't read the notes and talk to people at the same time. So I go with the slide, I, but I do have a fairly good memory, so I can keep going without notes. So that's, that's, that's where it is. And then I came to Britain uh, in 2001 when I finished my first degree in India, because we got college very uh, uh, early. So I went to university at 14, finished my first degree at 18, and to, turn, to, to train to be a priest, you need to be 21. Uh, so my bishop said, go and do something else for a couple of years. Uh, and then the Archbishop of Wales then, Barry Morgan, came to my university and said, we want missionaries to the UK. So I ended up in Chester Diocese in, in Cheadle, just down the road, uh, in Stockport, doing a gap year. I love the gap year. I love the people, which is brilliant. I absolutely love the food because I like meat, despite being Indian. I absolutely hated the weather. It was too cold, I couldn't deal with it, and it was too wet. And the next thing was that I struggled with the whole understanding of faith in Britain, because you don't have, in India everybody has a faith, so you know where to start your conversations from. But in Britain, I thought that this is really complicated, because I don't know where to start my conversations. So I went back to India, told my bishop, thank you very much, I'm never going to go back to that country ever again. Brilliant, thank you, I enjoyed it, because I did English Lit for my first two degrees, so that's it. Uh, but I still was too young to go to theological college, and I got a full scholarship to study in Gloucester. So I got knocked back back in Britain, and then after the degree I worked for something called Church Mission Society, CMS, uh, and I met my wife through there, who is an ordained Anglican minister, uh, ordained in Blackburn Diocese, and she went to Sri Lanka to work, so we ended up in Sri Lanka, and then we came back to Britain, and I collected a couple more degrees in the process, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, here we are. Uh, and the other thing I also want to say is that what I do now, uh, in between when I was training for uh, ordination, I realized that Church of England processes are slightly different for me than others because I'm not white British. But I worked for Anglican Communion quite a lot before, so I knew the process, and my wife was already ordained, so I knew the process, but still it was different. But when I went to Oxford for my master's, I realized that my wife struggled through that more from being a working class background, whereas I was son of a professor in India, so I knew how to work the academics. I can't spell, but I still know how to work the academics, so I was fine. Uh, but then when we got to those stages where uh, through the processes of Anglican Church we realized that we need something to bring the minority ethnic people together and we started a Facebook group and that was, we, I'm very proud of the acronym because it just came out when I was bathing my son, it is nothing that I thought through, it just thought that oh it works, amen, so, so that's how amen came about, we started as a small network of 14 people at the moment on Facebook we got around 600 people. It's a national network. We, uh, we work together. Our aim and vision is to increase the number of minority ethnic people or be, uh, UKME people in all stratas of church. So it is about networking. It's about connecting. It's about bringing together. But we are all volunteers, so the process is very slow. What we do, that's what we do. And now, what do I do? My boss is sitting straight in front of me. Uh, so uh, what do I do? I work for Emmanuel College. So Emmanuel College is a college for the Northwest. So we are Christ-centered. We are, uh, uh, we are, gosh, am I forgetting that now? Fulfill and 
mission orientated. That is the, that is the, uh, the motto of the college. So we are a college that is set up to serve the northwest of the country, to train people for the ministry of God in this part of the world. Full stop. And give me a hi if you are from, from Manuel. I can see a couple of hands. And uh, yeah, my, Michael is here and Bishop is our chair of trustees. Brilliant. So that is who I am. That is my context. Can I have the next slide, please? So what is the UK context? What is the context that we live in? If you just have a look at that screen, you can see the census data from 2001. We are at that stage where we are waiting for the next census data. It will come in next May. So until then, we are working with the previous data. And do you think, uh, we think that UK is very multi-ethnic, very diverse, and a lot of uh, talks about a certain newspaper I shall not name, uh, which says that you know UK is being swarmed by people from other races and nations. What do you think, looking at that statistics? Is that true? Okay, can we have the next slide, please? This is a more interesting one. In terms of Christianity, how the, how the religious statistics in Britain is changing. It is changing for sure. And after this, there is Pew Research study came out. There's a whole lot of studies came out showing that Christianity, number of people who are acknowledging they are Christians is declining. But still, just look at the statistics where we are standing as of 2001. It might have changed. So that is our context. Can I have the next slide, please? This is probably very interesting statistics we would like to look at. This shows the number of Christians from different backgrounds. So do we know that in Britain, uh, in Northwest, we have a cathedral of Christians from uh, South India in Preston? There's a Catholic cathedral of Malabar Rite in Preston. So there are a whole lot of Christians from other religious traditions here. Church of England may not be very diverse in many ways, but Christianity in Britain is definitely, definitely diverse. That is our context. The number of Christians who are from other ethnicities are increasing. Thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? So now the question is that how do we define whiteness? I am going to take this mic up and come out a little bit so that you can see the screen and me, and I think that might work. Yes. So whiteness, uh, so I said about whiteness in, the, in that slide. It said, you know, who is, uh, the ethnicities is uh, white people and different color. But how does it work? The word whiteness I'm using here today has very little to do with skin pigmentation. So who is white is a big question. If you, uh, if you remember, a few years ago, Irish people were never considered white. So you know the boards, which I shall not repeat here. What was the boards available in shops? Irish people was not considered white. And a lot of travelers were not considered white for a long time. And then uh, whiteness is also a negation of color. People think that whiteness is if you're not in any other color, you're white. If you don't have. So none of us are white, are we? Because if you ask children to paint pictures, they normally paint yellow people. They don't paint white people, ever. My children are a little bit confused because they are mixed heritage. So uh, we had to find special colors for them to paint, to re recommend their colors. And my daughter got very confused when, I was when she was little. She washed my hand to get, she looked at her hand and my hand and started scrubbing to thinking that I'm dirty. So that comes to next thing. Because we often associate whiteness with purity and higher standards. That is a colonial legacy that we have. And, uh, and whiteness is lack of color, it's neutral, it's higher or better because it's pure. That is what we, we are taught. It's not a fault, it's, that's what we are taught. And on the other hand, black or brown is dirty. Black or brown is uh, additional substance added on. So is white cloth always been made white or was it bleached to get it white? So next question. So then that also reflects on the people. 
how we see people. So when we look at people, we often say that, oh, this category of people are aggressive. This category of people are uh, uh, to be scared. And this category of people are the ones who's causing all the problems, whatever. But we need to remember, if you put racially, which race has caused more deaths in many of people of color have historically, more people of color have historically died at the hands of white terrorists through lynching, race riots, all that. That book is written in the context of American, uh, American history. It's a brilliant book. I would recommend you to read it. Uh, but it is challenging to read. Can I have the next slide, please? So, Contextual theology, this is my area. This is what I love. So I believe that every theology has to be done in context. But now I'm not taking God out here. God is what we are trying to learn. Jesus Christ is the revelation of uh, God is what we are trying to learn about. But we need to realize that Jesus came in a context. So are we living in a context? Stephen Bevins is a brilliant theologian. Uh, he's a Catholic theologian. If you'd like to buy one book, buy the book in the bottom, Theology from a Global Perspective. But if you would like to buy a cheap book, buy the book on the top, uh, uh, which is $1.99 in Amazon. Uh, uh, so, so he speaks about contextual theology in this way. He says that experience of the past, experience of the present, meeting together in mutual dialogue. So contextual theology is to develop that theology. Our theology should transform our context because anything that comes into touch with the living God will be transformed. Moses came out from the mountain shining. So we will be transformed by our theology. But on the other hand, our context should transform our theology as well. How we see God, how we understand God, that we'll understand. So some people will argue with me now that theology is non-subjective or objective. So I will leave that discussion for later. Can I have the next slide, please? So, Calvin, you're going to be in heaven now because I'm speaking about Wesley. So I would like to devil, uh, speak about how do we develop this theology. So I'm using Wesleyan quadrilateral. So it's reason, scripture, experience, and tradition, the pillars of theology. Can I have the next slide, please? So the first one is scripture. Is God a white man? So we already had the reference to that. So if man is God, God is man, uh, Mary Daly said in feminist theological concept. And scripture was and is used in support of all sorts of atrocities. You can use the scripture to work your way around often. And they have, people have done. Slavery was supported by uh, 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 people who use the scripture. They said about a uh, curse of harm. All sorts of things were used. So scripture was always being used. And in the past, it's also used to stop interracial marriages because it should be an abomination. You can't do that. And the present, in present, if you look at scripture, who gets to preach the scripture? Who gets to teach the scripture? It's a big question, isn't it? Because the Western theologians are still writing more books than the rest of the theological world. Is that because they don't know theology? Or is that because they don't have time to sit down and write theology? Or is that because they are writing in a different language? So it's the whole process we need to think through. Can I have the next slide? Oh, Ginny MacDonald's book is a brilliant book, If God is a White, uh, is, is, um, God is Not a White Man. It's a brilliant book. If you would like to read, please find it. It's also on Audible if you're dyslexic. That's the way forward. Can I have the next slide, please? So, scripture, what can we do? This is um, uh, John Mambiti. He's a um, brilliant African theologian uh, who... How do we as teachers and preachers make sure that our theology is not biased to our context? How do we make sure that, you know, the Christianity, the average Anglican is a black uh, woman of in their 30s, probably living in Nigeria. And if you put the statistic uh, center of gravity for Christianity itself in 2007, it was somewhere in Timbuktu but we don't know where that is, probably further moved south. So majority of Anglicans are not middle-aged, not male, uh, not white. 
So when the attacks on Sri Lanka happened, we realized that a lot of Anglicans, it was Catholic churches that was attacked. But still, we need to realize that majority Anglicans are poor. It is true even in this country. Majority Anglicans are not well off. We might think otherwise, but it's not. So Mambiti says, uh, you can read the quote yourself. I can't see it from here. And my memory is good, but not good to remember all of that. But you can see that Mambiti says, we of the Western, Eastern traditions or the other traditions, Global South, has come to you to learn theology. Will you come to us to learn theology now? Will you learn our language because in, in, in UK, we are very privileged. We, le- we speak only one language, that's it, if possible. Uh, whereas where I grew up, you have to have three to live by, and you need to be five to make any way around in the society. And now, when I go home, it's really confusing because children or young people text in mixed script because they use whichever shortest word in whichever language. So you need to know five, six languages to work out to what the text says. So it's, it's, it's a different world, isn't it? So do we, do we learn language from others? Do, are we ready to learn from the rest of the world? Can I have the next slide, please? Now, this is a reason. Uh, reason is often discussed as um, uh, the way we think, the slightest way of thinking about it. It's, uh, it's a very light way of thinking about it. But we need to think that we don't all think alike. So in those who are grew up in the West and those who are had Western education, we have to think in a rationalistic uh, uh, post-enlightenment way. But we don't all think alike. And then sec- th- second thing we need to remember about reason is also about how do we define race. Race is not genetical. It is not a scientific categorization. That's where we should start from. We should realize that race is real. You need to move back. Which way? This way? That way. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so race is... Sorry, those who are on camera, you are not seeing me. You haven't missed much. Uh, so racism has many definitions, and race has many definitions. But the core of it, that race is a social construct. I'm not saying that race doesn't exist. Race does exist because it's a social construct. It is not a genetical uh, factor, genetical decision. It is made by our society. These people are these races. It doesn't work genetically at all. There's quite a number of books to read about that. There is a How to Argue with the Racist is a brilliant one, and Racism's all that books you can find online and read. Uh, they are brilliant. Can I have the next slide, please? So, reason, science, and race. We have this inheritance of scientific uh, race theories which we inherited from uh, probably from Blumenbach in 1779. So he found out that these are, he decided that these are the basic categories of races, races. And often our thinking is biased and influenced by those categories. So just think about it, how much of our thinking is influenced by that. But we know now that 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 has no scientific proof whatsoever. Can I have the next slide, please? So scientific racism is interesting, isn't it? But that also transpires into all sorts of different levels. People do ancestry checking now. I told you in the beginning, I have a family tree. It goes back to AD 52. I told you that it's my heritage. I was very proud of it. But the other side is that it is also used to affirm our caste identity in India. So I'm from a Syrian Christian background, so we, do, we are not Dalit. So it's that huge gap between the two. And ancestor checking is often used as a tool to define how truly white I am. Oprah Winfrey, for example, she wants to prove that how black she is. So how do we work? How do we see that? And then it comes all sorts of ways. In the pictures, you can see that uh, a black man being licked. I don't know whether you know the story. The story is that it's believed that slaves who can retain more salt will live uh, in, the, in the ship, in the passage. 
Uh, so the slave traders used to lick. If they are salty uh, on, their, uh, on their sweat, they can't retain salt, so they probably will die on the way uh, down. And that being even now used a reason to show why black people have more, um, uh, more blood pressure, and because that's because all the people who came from Africa in the first place are the people who could retain more salt. But none of those has no scientific evidence whatsoever. And then there is a theories that, oh, people can run faster from this particular village in Africa because they had to run, uh, outrun the Panthers. Not really, no. Because one person ran and they got a good job and it worked, so everybody practiced more, it worked. So there's no genetical uh, attachment to any of this. Can, can, I have, can I have a next slide, please? What can we do about reason? So we need to remember that not all of us think alike. There is no getting out of it. Understanding and teaching non-scientific nature of racism is very important. We need to tell our children, we need to tell our congregations that race is a social construct. There's no way out of it. You cannot say that race is uh, scientific because it is not. And then unconscious bias is a big term now, uh, and it's something that we need to work on as well. Unconscious bias is thinking about somebody and taking a quick judgment. I first recently had an experience. Somebody thought that I was a, a taxi driver uh, uh, in one of, the, one of the church offices, which shall remain anonymous, uh, in one of the dioceses. Uh, and, uh, and the interesting thing was that I straight away got out and said, I, uh, and then they looked at my badge, and they were very apologetic, uh, and then and I offered, by the way, I'm an unconscious bias trainer for Church of England. I'll be happy to offer you for free training for your diocese. So that, that's, there you go. Uh, and then there is a test your bias. You, there is a test developed by Harvard, um, uh, Harvard University. If you Google it, you'll see that. Where is your biases lie? We do associate ourselves to certain biases. And we do associate. Yesterday I had an interesting scenario. We were moving house, so we ordered fish and chips uh, and I, for the whole crew. Uh, and I ordered some sausages and chips and some fish and chips and I rocked up at the shop uh, and to pick up the fish and chips uh, and the guy just looked at me, oh you said your name is Matthew but you're not and stopped there and then I said it's a good job that I put all the sausages underneath uh, so the fish is on top because he assumed that I'm a Muslim uh, so I should have the sausages non-contaminated fish non-contaminated, so he put the fish on top and, he's, and he said oh you can have these uh, uh, things for free uh, so welcome to the neighborhood so how does that unconscious bias work? And I rocked, I've, I've been at Westminster uh, Abbey and I was told that I don't look like an Anglican vicar uh, when I got in. And in my last job, I used to wear long shirts often as a school university chaplain and a dog collar. And people used to ask, does Muslim chaplains wear dog collar these days? How does unconscious bias work? Test your bias, that's a good thing to test it out. But be kind to yourself when you test it. Be kind when you, when you see the results, because it might shock you. Can I have the next slide, please? So tradition. Tradition is um, interesting, isn't it? What traditions? Uh, that, that, that picture is of Sambo's grave. I don't know whether you know. It's in Sunderland Point. Uh, it's the boy, slave boy, who died in Sunderland Point, and there's a grave there. But when we look at history, how do we look at it? Because when we read about Sambo, the slave boy who died in Sunderland Point, uh, we speak more about the kind headmaster who gave land for this boy to be buried than the boy himself. So how does it look? And then we look at our hymns, when Greenland's icy mountains, what's wrong with that hymn? We have in my language, there is one church, is one foundation. There's a stanza which says, India is a beautiful country, but people are just savages. And it's translated into Malayalam. We just skip that stanza and sing the rest. So then we look at the past. How do we look at the past? Can we look at the past with the current sensibilities? That's why I got the roads there as well, uh, which was quite an interesting. I've, I've done more interviews on roads than anyone else, uh, being the chaplain in one of the colleges, one of the universities in Oxford. Can I have uh, next slide, please? So tradition, what can we do? 
owing our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as send, spending our lives running from it. Brené Brown is brilliant. Uh, it's nothing to do with unconscious bias, any of race theory, but she's brilliant. So she says that you need to own our story. We do have the heritage of uh, slavery. Um, we know that some of our mission agencies had slaves. We know that some of our bishops had slaves. We do have history of slavery. We have done it, but we need to accept our past. But what do we do with the history is something that we need to discuss and think about. What do we do with our statues? What do we do with our pictures? And do we judge our past with current sensibilities in 10 years from time? Or in Michael's words, probably even now, those who are eating meat will be condemned, probably, as Christians. Do you agree? I think Michael is agreeing already. I can see that. And then post-colonial critique of theology and liturgy. Where do we go? You know the collects like light in our darkness. Just think about it. Does it really work in, in, the, in the sensibility of color and darkness, how darkness is associated with race? I love that collect. That's another point. But think about that. Can I have the next slide, please? So experience is the next stage so what is the experience of the uh, UK ME people in Britain in the first place uh, pandemic was quite interesting isn't it pandemic was uh, we saw the results of pandemic how people are affected we realize that oximeters are not set for the darker skin color so it can't read the uh, uh, read the oxygen level of darker it works it, it creates me problems as well because the, our thermometer don't work on me it works on my wife and children it doesn't work on me because it's either calibrated to me or to them so how does that work, you know, things. It's the same with women. Seat belts are not designed for women. Stab vests are not designed for women. We know that. So how does the experience? We know the experience of the past from slavery, racism, all that, but what is our current experience? Uh, what is the what is the experience of uh, people in Church of England from our context? What is the experience of UKME? How do we develop a theology for mission? If you are reaching out to people of Britain in general, how do we develop that theology from this context is something that we need to think about. Can I have the next slide, please? Ooh. Can I have the next slide? Yep, brilliant. Uh, there is, if you are thinking about um, particular relations with, uh, relationship between race and um, uh, things like s a knife crime, and uh, the experience looking at it, how do we associate with particular races with particular things, do have a look at Akala's book. And there is a video, which we shall not have time to watch today, but there is a video. If you search for Akala knife crime, you will see the video how he describes. Knife crime is often attributed to black communities, but it is completely wrong. But if you look at him, he explains it beautifully. I'm very proud because he's an alumnus of Oxford Brooks, and he, we managed to get him to speak a number of times. And uh, Afua Hirsch is brilliant as well. If you would like to read the book Brit-ish, he speaks about uh, mixed heritage. She speaks about all sorts of different things. It's a brilliant book. And Good Immigrant and Me and My White Supremacy, which is something is quite humbling to read. And even from a... Um, privileged uh, ME background, minority ethnic background, it is quite humbling to read. Can I have the next slide, please? So identity, I would like to come to identity. I'm just going to check the time, just so that I know where I'm going. As I said, I don't have the watch. So, yeah, I'm doing pretty well. I'm fine, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, identity, how, how is our identity developed? So this is something that we need to think about. Our identity is unique. We are all made in the image of God. So I was asked by somebody, how can we make UK ME people equal in Church of England? My answer was that you don't need to make us equal because we are made in the image of God. We are all equal. But our identity is far more complicated. So it's culture, family background, as I said, I, this is another funny story from, uh, I was asked to present a paper in one of the Oxford colleges. We went there and they started conversation saying that, uh, thank you so much, Shemel, for coming up from Oxford Brooks, it's just up the road. Uh, and uh, we never get anybody who is not white, not middle class, and not Oxbridge educated here to present papers. 
I just went, I ticked two of those boxes. But I'm not white, I agree that. So our identity is not defined by uh, one thing. It is complex. We are all complex people. Our identity is defined by different things. I told you about my wife, who's my working class background. She struggled through the Oxford system because she struggled as the first person to go to university from her family. That was the challenge. And our language, how do we speak? Which accent do you have? And how do you sound? And which words do you use? Social activity, economic abilities, skin color, hair, a lot of things. You can't go to every hairdresser if you've got curly hair. You realize that very quickly because they don't know how to cut it. But in my case, it's very easy because it's, there's no, nothing left. Uh, learning to accept our multiple identities is the first step. We need to understand that we are a complicatedly made human uh, beings because we are made in the image of God. We, are le we need to learn to accept that we are interconnected, but we are fighting hybridity. We are not all one. We are one in Christ, but we are many parts so we are different. We can't make you all one. So my grandfather, when he became Anglican, the difference, there's a picture, which shows very funny because he got a black, he got a shirt and a dhoti. Dhoti is the sarong thing, cloth. Uh, and in the first picture, he's wearing a dhoti and a shirt. And the second picture, he became an Anglican, so he got a black jacket on top. That's the difference. So how does that work? And we are fighting hybridity. We are not making everything into one because we are different and the diversity is, the, is our uh, gift. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is where I would like to conclude. Um, okay, celebrating interconnected difference. Rabbi Sachs is a brilliant inspiration for me. I uh, um, recently passed away. His book, uh, John, uh, Dignity of Difference and Morality, are brilliant. And if you have time, read Dignity of Difference. If you have more time, do morality. And if you have no time, watch the YouTube clips. It's brilliant. And he says about uh, interconnected difference. We encounter God in the face of a stranger that I believe is the Hebrew Bible's single greatest and most counterintuitive contribution to ethics. Michael is an ethicist, he can tell me wrong if he's wrong. God creates differences, therefore it is, the one, it is in one who is different that we meet God. It is in one who is different that we meet God. How can we meet God, one who is different? This brings us to my final slide, if I can have one, please. Next slide, please. So, when we struggle with understanding and respecting differences, we need to remember that our eschatological vision is a place where we all come together. So, in this world, we are struggling with differences. Why do, how do you think we will survive in the next to come? So Richard Ross speaks that, says that if you are in heaven in this world, you are, you are on your way to heaven because the reason is that if you are experiencing the presence of God and delighting in it now, you will delight it in heaven too. But if you don't delight in the presence of God in this world, how do you think we are going to get delight from the presence of God in heaven? So in the same way, if you don't take delight in difference in this world, how are we going to take delight in the world to come? So my eschatological vision and our mission should be shaped by this word. After, all, after this I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from every tribes of people and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. So this is our vision. So in the Tower of Babel, the languages were scattered. But if you remember it, that before that, that passage, there's a passage which speaks about the table of nations. So nations were already formed, but they were bring together by hybridity into one language, and then God scattered it. So God is a God who likes differences. And in Pentecost, we see they're all speaking in different languages. They could have learned the same language, isn't it? Life would have been a lot easier if they would suddenly learn one language, but they didn't. They all learned different languages. So difference is where uh, God created us, and that's where we should thrive. Thank you very much.
Shamal, just going to stand a little bit back so we can actually see you on the... Oh, uh, sorry. On, on the, 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 the YouTube. Thank you very much for that. How you've got so much energy after you've just moved house, I have no idea. But it uh, uh, bodes well for all the students at Emmanuel Theological College, so that's great. Um, we have some time for questions, and equally, if you're watching on YouTube and you want to put a question, uh, we're monitoring the questions as uh, the uh, comments as they come in. So do do please put your questions into the chat, and we'll pick them up here as well. There will be a chance for a plenary session at the end of the day uh, that Bishop Mark is going to chair. So you, 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 as you're going through the day, if you suddenly think, oh, I wish I'd asked Shamal that particular question, write it down, save it for the end of the day, we can bring them up then. But uh, if there are questions now, that would be great uh, on, uh, on, on what Shamal said. So if anybody w would, would, would like to uh, fire away with a question, who's going to be brave and go first? Or comments at all? Mark, you're going to come at the back? Hang on a minute. Uh, thank you. That was superb, Shamal. My question is around your um, definition of whiteness and presumably then of, of, of other uh, coloured identity. And, and I really uh, warm to the idea that that's a social construct, not simply pigmentation of skin. Um, but my mind then goes on to say, how does that help us solve the problems that we face? Because if somebody is socially racist and yeah. thus, uh, for example, uh, dislikes Pakistani culture or so, social construct, then they're still racist, even though the racism might not be addressed to those of a certain color of skin. Does that make any sense at all? It does, because um, it's, uh, race often transpires skin color, you're right, uh, in terms of there are very fair uh, uh, people from, uh, uh, we got Anglo-Indians, for example, the Portuguese, they are actually Portuguese descendants. Uh, so people do get confused, even in India, when we go around and my wife wears uh, Indian clothing, they think that she might be Indian and she got an Indian passport, so that doesn't help. So, uh, so it, it, does, it does transpire as race in, in that level, skin color. But I think this, the whiteness, as we understand, is, is a word that denotes privilege. It is not about, it's, Afua Hirsch says that it is not being worried about when you go into a space. Uh, for example, I don't normally go to charity shops with donations. The reason is that I went a number of times. Uh, every time I went, they said, no, thank you. When Becky, my wife, went with the same donations in the same bag, two minutes later or five minutes later, they took it. So I don't know what does that say. So it's, it's that difference. So whiteness, has very little, whiteness also has very little to do with uh, skin color, but what we use white in most in the society, we need to think. So I would like to ask if the working class people of Northwest, are they white? My wife would argue that she's not in that level. So how does it, Michael, I think it's noting. Do you like to add something, Michael? Okay. Uh, anybody, anybody else? Yeah, Jacob. Come, come back to you in a second. Hello, uh, thank you, Shimal. Um, <clears throat> you talked about the eschatological vision that we should sit together and we worship and say hallelujah. And, but my problem is here and now. You know, my brothers are not allowed to come and worship in the church where I am going. Mm. And the pastor is telling, uh, first Sunday they said, welcome, good morning, brother, you sit here. And the ne next Sunday, the second Sunday, the pastor is telling, the priest is telling, why don't you find a church closer to the place where you are living? Mm. Which means you are not welcome to come and sit and worship in my church. Mm -hmm. You find a place, you go and sit and worship, not here. Yeah. So the eschatological vision is great. Yeah. But my problem is here and now. Yeah. I am not allowed to worship, sit and worship and sing songs in mm -hmm. the church where we are sharing the common chalice. Yeah. So what's the solution for that? So then we will go for the eschatological vision. Yeah. So we need to resolve the issue here, right and now, in the church where we are worshiping, yeah. where we are praising God. Yeah. So this morning, before I come here, I went to a restaurant to have a breakfast. I was hungry. 
So I didn't have the clerical collar. The lady who served my breakfast said, uh, Sir, um, this is a pure meat. And you don't have to worry about it. You can eat it. Uh, it is halal meat. I told her, uh, excuse me, I'm, I can eat any meat. You know, it is a halal meat, pure meat, or impure meat. So I can eat any kind of meat if you serve on my plate. So the, you know, the people, when you go to the restaurant, they ask, they treat you differently. When you come to the church, you are treated differently. So I'm, I'm hoping that I will allowed to sit around the table where Jesus sit. And whether halal meat serve or non halal, I don't care. But I am worried about here and now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think that, that's where the eschatological vision should come to be. That's why I said that if we are not happy about having people in, of difference in our community now, how will we be happy in the, play, in the, in the future to come? So that is the question we need to pose to such situations. We need to ask, how can we be, how can, if we are not happy now, how will we be happy in the place to come? Because it's, it's going to be even more of, of diversity. That's, that's, that's where it is. Thank you. Just to add to, to, to the question that Jacob said, I, one of the, the, the uh, you, you talked a bit about unconscious bias. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's something that we're very aware of in what is a very white diocese. Uh, because you'll often hear people, uh, well, well, I've heard people in the past say, uh, well, we, we wouldn't really want somebody from uh, a different ethnic background here. It's not, nothing to do with us, but they wouldn't feel comfortable in this context. And uh, it's kind of difficult, isn't it, to, 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 to get people to realize just how that reflects the unconscious bias that's within them. Yeah. And I just wondered whether you had any comment uh, about somebody who, who uh, 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 about how you tackle that, that with, with people. Unconscious bias is a difficult thing. Some people, some psychologists would argue that it, it shouldn't, the training is not good enough. But some people will argue that we need specific training for specific situations. We need to have anti-racism training in particular. But how do we... We need to understand that there's a whole lot of political discussion going on there as well, including putting certain people against certain people. So we've been told often that white uh, working class is racist. That is the narrative that people like to argue. But you need to understand that actually UK ME people have far more common with white working class than anyone else. And um, there was a comment on uh, something in social media. I got this massive letter from somebody who is a builder saying that, Shemel, they told that white working class is racist. How are you going to respond against it? I'm your best friend. I was like, yes, this, this, is, this is where the politics plays in there as well. So yes, yeah, okay. we need to work on it. Thank Lovely. you. Karen, I think you had your hand up, didn't you? Okay. Hello. Um, a couple of years ago, our curate was telling me that the new thinking is that we shouldn't have any pictures of Jesus in our churches because we have pictures of a white Jesus with long hair, what we were all brought up with. And she couldn't understand why I couldn't agree with her and I couldn't see what is, what, why she was right. But the point is, she also said that if we have a picture of God or Jesus, it means we bring him down to our level so we can't, um, we reduce our expectations of what he can do. And I just didn't agree. And I said, but yes, we have a white God. An African has an African God. A Chinese man has a Chinese God because we're all made in God's image. So surely the answer isn't that we shouldn't have our picture of Jesus as we all grew up from children, but surely in all our churches we should have these pictures we've got here now. We should have an African, a Chinese, a Japanese. We should have more pictures of God. And 
it was Bible Sunday on Sunday, yep. and it was saying that there are different versions of the Bible because there are so many different facets of God. Yeah. So surely, if we have several multiracial pictures and statues of Jesus in our churches, it will show all the different facets of God. Brilliant. Thank you. That, that's an interesting comment, isn't it? Um, what, what I would, can I just throw in a comment to that? Is that I believe that God is not something that we cannot understand, but God is something, a person, that we can continuously understand. So it's beyond our understanding. We can keep learning about God forever. That's why God is God. So in terms of ethnicity, pictures, all that, we need to see that God is beyond. That's, that's where I would stand. Sorry. So, next, yeah. Lovely. Similar question. Any, 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 anybody else? Yes. Jeremy. But, um, yes, I'd like to take, take that further. Right. Um, the wonderful thing about the exhibition is we've managed to find images of Chinese, um, Japanese, Asian, Indian, things that we just could not find, were very difficult to find. But going back to your point when you showed us the picture about, uh, of Cecil Rhodes at Oriel College, what do we do in a church like this or the church where you may worship where significant proportion of our images are not necessarily relating to the people who we are or the culture or belief we are today rather than what our ancestors do. What would your advice be for this diocese about how we work forward with what we've inherited? Okay, we cannot erase our history. Um, I agree with Boris on that bit, Boris Johnson on that bit. We cannot erase our history. But I would say that we need to acknowledge our history as well. So uh, some of the statues, for example, are being renamed to show that Cecil Rhodes, you can put us, but he was also... Yeah, what was his background? So that is what is important. We cannot delete our history because in deleting our history is no good for anybody. But we need to acknowledge our past. That is where it goes. That is what is the repentance, isn't it? Repentance is not just turning away from sin now. It is about turning away from sin, but trying to make sure that it will never happen again. So otherwise it's not, is it? It's not real true repentance. Right, thank you, Shimon. Anybody else? Calvin? Thank you for that. It's, it's not a question as much as a, a follow-up comment to the conversation we've just had. I wonder whether in a building such as this, whether it isn't also about commissioning future windows which acknowledge what is missing mm. Uh, and acknowledge pretty much what you said, that the average Anglican today is a black woman in her 30s, probably in West Africa somewhere. Yeah. And given that you do have some gaps on windows over there, uh, yeah. uh, that might be the next fundraising project for this great building, to say, how do we commission some new windows to complement the ones that we already have to try to tell the truth of the next phase of the church's life? So. Yeah. It's, really? it's both holding on to the heritage, but also yeah. saying it's insufficient and we need to add yeah. uh, to it. So some of these sorts of images ending up in your windows in this building in the future would be an interesting legacy, I wonder. But I can say that easily because I don't pay for any of it. So here there. I've, I've got the, the, the presenter and the dean. The getting very excited. I've got the presenter and the dean fighting to tell you, tell, tell you everything about this, this building. It really is important to tell you what the legacy is starting. The picture over there, the Judas Kiss by Lorna May Wadsworth, is going to remain here at the end of the exhibition on long-term loan. And we're looking, but cannot confirm at the moment, that a further picture in the North Choir Isle of the Last Supper may be part of a legacy here. And the blue, the, the blue Jesus... Um, by Lorna May Wadsworth, which we have a copy, has been given to us. So it's a starting point, but I'm also looking at that window too. But the Dean Tim might also have something to say as well. Thank you. But there is a legacy which we also want to share for the diocese. Thank you. I think it's true to say as well that we're hoping that uh, 
A lot of the uh, pictures that are in the exhibition will be traveling around the country. I know that there are other cathedrals, for example, who are interested in taking the exhibition. And indeed, we're hoping to, to, to uh, uh, show some of the pictures around the diocese as well. So to start conversations like this all over the diocese so that the sorts of thoughts that we're going through today will, will carry on uh, way past the end of this, this exhibition. Tim. Just to say, uh, Calvin, thank you. Uh, I mean, your suggestion uh, of new images that represent the people of God as we understand the people of God today actually fills me with energy, and I, I hope that is something that we can respond to. Uh, thank you. I don't know whether you want to add anything to that at all, no, Sean. fine, thank you. No, you're okay. Any, anybody else? Okay, well, we've had a good start. Thank you, Shemel. Thank you very much for your contribution to, uh, to, to this, uh, this day. Uh, we're going to uh, take a break. Now, I would say that, uh, I mean, the, the, this is a living, working building. You'll see that there are people wandering around, uh, and uh, that's great. We, we, it's, it might be a little bit distracting at times, but I hope that you can uh, uh, just focus all your uh, uh, thoughts here. Uh, what we... What I would encourage you to do is to take your bags with you, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, but uh, the, the refectory is, is open, so please, please do uh, go and get yourself a cup, cup of tea or coffee. I should think you're ready for it by, by now. If we, there's plenty of time. We're, we're, we are leaving plenty, plenty of space in the day. Uh, so if we can all be back here for uh, quarter to 12, please, and uh, Cham will be speaking to us then. So, if that's okay, can we give you a big round of applause to Shemel? Thank you very much. So, do uh, enjoy just a half hour break, and we'll be back here at quarter two.
I think no, not at all. We're just uh, waiting for uh, folk to gather. If there's anybody in the cathedral coming to the uh, the next talk, then uh, perhaps you'd like to make your way down to the high altar uh, in the choir. Uh, we're going to start in two minutes. Final call for those in the cathedral who might be coming to the talk to make their way to the choir. That would be good. Okay, for those of you who have ordered sandwiches for lunch time, they'll be delivered to the chapter house, which is just down uh, the way here uh, so we'll go and get there and there'll be, there will be tea and coffee available in the chapter house at lunchtime. Uh, if you want your proper uh, uh, f- barista coffee that's the term is it proper barista coffee then you're, I'm afraid you'll have to go to the cathedral, uh, the, the cathedral ref- refectory but there will be ordinary tea and coffee served in the, um, in the chapter house at lunchtime. So, I think there's one or two still uh, coming back, but we'll, we'll get going. Um, it's, I hope you've, uh, you, you've had a chance to uh, have, a, have a, a piece of cake and a cup of tea, and that you've perhaps warmed up a little bit. Um, we've got uh, our next session now, uh, which is going to be led by the Reverend Cham Kaur Man. Now, uh, Cham is the first Asian woman Baptist minister. I believe that's, is that right? Correct. So, uh, uh, Cham, it's lovely to have you with us. Uh, I know that you're going to share something of your story with us, so I I won't say anything more about about you. I'll leave you to do that. But it's a delight to welcome you here, and uh, we really look forward to hearing what you've got to say to us. So can we welcome Cham, please, everybody? Good morning. Hi to those of you who are on, um, on Zoom, live, YouTube even. There you go, so many of these things that are happening out there. But it's great to have you with us, joining us uh, this morning. And um, I don't know about you, but I, or my mind is buzzing after having listened to Shamil. And um, so many thoughts are going around, but exciting thoughts. And um, what was really exciting also towards the end is the sense of actually there's more we can do. This is simply an opening up, a breaking of ground. And it's fantastic that um, Chester Diocese have had the, um, that real sense of, of just exploring further. And it's when we all come around the table um, with all our distinctives that something quite remarkable can happen and I believe that this exhibition that we have here is is just tremendous and uh, thank you for being courageous enough to do that and to put money where your aspirations were and uh, 
Thank you, Ian, for your invitation also. Um, I've been asked to explore an area around leadership in the church, and particularly when you're black or Asian. And um, I'm going to preface everything with a nice statement, because it's all about me. And, um, but I can only speak from my for myself, I can only represent myself, but I'm sure that there will be themes that may well resonate with you, whatever your locations and wherever you are. So, um, as Ian said, I'm currently the first and only female Baptist minister in the UK. So, so that's, that's a bit about the sort of the reverend bit. I've pastored a white majority church co-planted and co-pastored a black majority church. I'm also co-director of an organization called Next Leadership Consulting, and um, we work with leaders who frankly are change makers, um, who work with change makers themselves. And for us, it's just really important that we invest ourselves in um, developing leaders, in growing leaders, men and women across denominations. Um, but we get really excited when the idea of um, leadership is right there in the center. And I have a heart for um, the global south. Um, and we do some work in, in parts of East Africa as well as West Africa. So um, yeah, very excited. So that's a bit about myself. Um, and some of you might be sitting there thinking, oh, but Cham, you know, it sounds, your, your journey sounds so smooth. And it sounds so easy. Um, um, in the words of an author I particularly like, her name's Mira Sayal, um, she says, life isn't all ha ha he he. And, and I'm sure we can all testify to that in um, our own experiences. So I want to begin to share a bit about my story. I, it's always helpful for me to be able to locate the speaker um, where they're coming from, um, and hopefully it will also make sense of who I am um, and what I say and what I do correlate. So just to give you a bit of an idea of where I'm coming from, I was born into a Sikh family. We lived in a place called Smethwick. I know the name does not roll off your tongue quite easily, but Smethwick was within the constituency that a certain Peter Griffiths, a conservative MP, gained a seat in Parliament on the back of a racist slogan, which I can't repeat. So Smethwick was where I grew up. We shared our two and a half bedroom terrace house with two Jamaican families. So it was a multi-occupancy household. Each family had a bedroom to live in, and we helped and supported each other to make ends meet. So you can imagine that the house was very busy. It had fragrances of curry, and it had curry goat as well, and, you know, plantain and rice and peas. So there was already a bit of the United Nations going on in the house. We also lived on a particular street, and it was an infamous street, and it was called Marshall Street. And at the time, in the 1960s, it was called the most racist street in Britain. Why, you may ask? Well, because its white residents petitioned the local council to buy up the empty housing stock on the street to prevent people of colour from buying any property for themselves or to indeed rent any out. So it was a street that was known for its segregation, the street where black and Asians were scared to walk alone. However, it was also the very street that African American civil rights activist Malcolm X paid a visit after being invited by the Asian Workers' Union. They invited him because they wanted his wisdom, they wanted his support against the racism and the segregation that was occurring. 
So you can get a bit of a picture of what life was like in the area and on that street in particular. It was, the atmosphere was slightly toxic and intimidating. As children, I'd remember, we'd play in front of people's houses. And I remember a number of times um, the residents, who at the time happened to be white, they'd come out with brooms to shoo us away. And I thought that was a game, which is just as well, really, because I thought that we were just playing tag. But that was a bit about the atmosphere. Home life, well, it was about survival. It was one day at a time. I grew up in a context where my role was prescribed as a girl child. My family had no aspirations for me except to get through school, have an arranged marriage, fulfill duties within an extended family, and that was fairly normal. Education was definitely not a priority. My mom is illiterate in Punjabi. My dad worked night shifts. His English was very, very basic. So there was no one around to help me with my reading and writing. Although when I was at infant school, I did get some help in literacy, but I had to go to a special class. But for me, I understood special classes they were there for special people. So I thought I was really special. So you can understand, my understanding was quite limited. Um, but I ended up having to really push myself and teach myself to read and write. And you might be thinking, crikey champ, you wrote, you've only reached infant age and life seems to be quite um, interesting or chaotic. But, you know, despite the challenges on Marshall Street and all the headlines that it brought, some good things did happen. Some good things did happen. You see, there was an Anglican church, and I know the Anglicans, um, they're, they're probably thinking, yeah! And it was, it was one of those moments. And you could have cheered, but I know you, you won't. And the Anglican church was called St. Paul's. And as a child, I and other kids on the street we would go to youth club on a Friday. And admittedly, my parents used it as a child-minding service, but I used it as an opportunity to get out of the house, to find a safe space to play, and there was always a bag of sweets at the end. I'm just putting it out there. I went for the sweets and the play. Now, during this time, at youth club, I heard stories about someone they called Jesus. In the pictures, he just happened to be depicted as very blonde and very white, and he seemed to have a sheep a draped over his shoulders, which I didn't really understand, but that didn't seem to matter for me. But one thing I do remember as a child, thinking to myself, I would really like to have a friend like Jesus. And at the time, I wasn't sure whether I was talking to myself in English or Punjabi or Punjabi in English or both. I don't know. But I know that prayer went up out of my heart and it was an arrow prayer. I continued to attend the youth club, but then came the opposition. The opposition came from my family and our Sikh community to the point where things got so heated that I was forbidden from going to youth club, to the white church, talking about the white Jesus. And I was then accused of being a bad influence on my peers and bringing shame on my family. Nevertheless, the time at youth club was really significant because a seed had been sown. So those of you who are out there, sometimes you're thinking, I'm, 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 I'm leading youth clubs. You know, sometimes it feels like, will any seed ever grow? Let me assure you, just keep on doing what you're doing. Because, hello, I'm here. Many, many years later, I ended up at university. And it was at university that I gave my life to Jesus. Life took an interesting turn. Now, this was the best, most life-giving decision I have ever, ever made in my life. But also the most painful in terms of opposition, 
ostracism, challenge and hurt, which came from my family and my community, who again felt that I had betrayed them, I had dishonoured them, and I'd brought shame on the family name. Again, this is a very familiar theme for those who've converted from other faiths. And add to the fact that I was single, it was like a double jeopardy. But life didn't get easier, I'm afraid. I'd like to up the level of joy in this space, but it didn't get any easier as a follower of Jesus. And the reality is I didn't expect it to, so I was under no illusions that, you know, being a follower of Jesus suddenly magics away um, challenges or difficulties. You know, life is life and we're on earth and we have to live it. But I didn't expect the challenge to come from the era it did. Um, the church. For me, I thought becoming a follower of Jesus, being part of a community, a community of, uh, who love Jesus, that it would be a, a, an oasis for me. But I have to say that life in the church was interesting. I have to confess, it was culturally alien, and it was very, very unfamiliar. Remember, I come from a Sikh background. Godwara life was my go-to place. For example, within the Godwara, my normal as a Sikh would have been visiting the Godwara, eating and tucking into hot, delicious, ghee-laden vegetarian dishes with hot roti, buttered of course, with hot sweet jar, and I know the juices are flowing now, aren't they? And it was with as many Indian sweets as you could manage, and since I've got such a sweet tooth, I managed an incredible amount. So imagine, when I arrived at church, I couldn't understand why we weren't offered food part way through the service. I couldn't understand it. And that the only offering at the end of the service was a dry biscuit. And this is the truth, I'm not making any of this up. It was a dry biscuit and the weakest and the most lukewarmest of teas in a chipped cup. And I couldn't understand why we sat on benches with carpet strips nailed to the wooden seats. Because in a Godwara you sit on, on carpets. They may be covered because Indians like to cover everything with an extra layer of cloth. But, 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 but we'd sit in a warm environment and I couldn't understand why people wore coats, hats and gloves throughout the service. In fact, I detect one or two coats and scarves in this space at this moment as we speak. But I realized it, there was an issue around heating. And then I didn't understand the word denomination. You see, my understanding was that denomination related to currency. But I didn't realize that denomination within the church um, spoke about different perspectives and traditions. You know, for me, it was all about following Jesus, but I didn't realize that there were different contours to that. And then I couldn't understand the language that was used um, when reading the Bible. There were different versions um, or some of the hymns that were sung. It was like another world. Um, and then the sound of the organ. I was terrified. Although I'm looking forward to the organ recital later on. I've got used to it. But, but you can imagine you come into the church and you hear this sound and you're thinking, oh my goodness me, what have I done? Do I need to run out? As you can imagine, my learning curve was steep. You see, I had to educate myself. Not only was I um, in a process of discipleship, learning more about Jesus and being part of this community, but um, I found that I had to run where others were walking. So forever on alert, having to educate myself all the time. And then somewhere along the line, 
I sensed a call to ministry and this had to be explored. And it felt peculiar, it felt bonkers. And frankly, I ran a mile from the call, but clearly God had the last word. The additional challenge that I faced was that there was no one else who looked like me around. And so therefore, there were very few spaces or places or people I could go to for advice or support because I didn't know anyone. I wasn't in the Christian circles uh, long enough. And then the next hurdle, and there were quite a few hurdles, I had to navigate ministerial selection boards and the culture of the Western um, mindset of, of interview was very peculiar to me. And then there were the, uh, the Bible colleges and the curriculums. I couldn't relate to some of the stuff that was coming from there. And it's not that I couldn't read because I'd learned to read and write by then. But it was like it didn't resonate with my lens or my perspective. And then there were institutional structures that I had to navigate. And then during this period, I realized that people had a particular perspective of me and particular expectations of me of what I should be according to their expectations, how I should behave. On more than one occasion, I have to say, in fact, many occasions over the years, I've been regularly patronized, paternalized, policed, infantilized, blanked and bullied um, as a minister by my fellow Christian brothers and sisters. Um, within the church and um, microaggressions continue you know um, it feels as if that's part of life Um, and it's it's a huge challenge it's a huge challenge and I've even had spaces um, when I pastored a white majority church members of the congregation leaving not you might think because I'm a woman that was not the issue It was the fact that I am an Asian woman in ministry, and they couldn't handle that. They returned back to the church after I left, which says something. But for me, a lifeline did appear. And it appeared in the form of a forum for black and Asian clergy and leaders at Birmingham University. And it was there that I realized that there were others who were experiencing similar challenges and setbacks. But I discovered a space, a safe space to speak and to share. And I received insight and wisdom on how to navigate this journey of faith that I'd been invited on through my encounter with Jesus, where we learned from each other and supported each other. As the only Asian female voice around the table, then and now, actually, um, I find myself still helping to uh, correct people's stereotypes and expectations of, and in particular Asians generally, but I can't speak on behalf of um, all Asians, because if you look at me and Shamil, you'll notice we come from very different parts of, of India. I'm a northerner, he's a southerner. Um, we, our, our dishes are very different. We might eat with the same utensils, that's, that is our hands, but we're very, very different. We speak different multiple languages. Um, but I find myself doing that, and I find myself helping people to narrow the gap in terms of their cultural understanding of, of uh, communities um, and their cultural competence. I, I like to help people along. Um, in that journey. I often find within the church that people's expectations of me as an Asian woman in leadership are incredibly low. Incredibly low. They, they really keep the bar as low as they possibly can. And this is usually reflected in the responses that I've received over the years. I'll just give you a few because we haven't got all that time. Um, I've been asked if the sermons I've preached were written by me. I've had my English grammar corrected by people after I've preached. I mean, somebody came up to me and and I thought, oh, they want to discuss the sermon. You know, um, I've spent a great deal of time thinking this through. You know, 
And, and it wasn't any of that, you know. Um, it was as if that came and went. But they came to correct my English um, and uh, the grammar. Um, and I was tempted, but I resisted. I resisted um, from responding with the news. I actually have a degree in English. Um, and that sometimes I deliberately create my own sentences and I deliberately make up words. They're familiar words, but I like to mix it up a bit. Um, and they're not according to the English language, but I did resist. I did resist from correcting them. I smiled. My personal story, my context, the critical decisions I've made in life in relation to my calling and my leadership have all been defining moments, which I hope give you a bit of a glimpse into who I am and why I'm committed to working with people who are serious about tackling the issues we face today, within the church and beyond. I'm committed to working with and developing leaders, strengthening the arms of the change makers. So that's where I'm at at this moment in time. But where does it all lead to? It leads to, unsurprisingly for some of you, to scripture, where throughout the years I have found incredible hope and comfort and inspiration and felt more at home in the pages of scripture because of the familiar cultural nuances that are located there and the themes that resonate so deeply with my experience. And I am so, so grateful that we're still in Black History Month so that I can continue to celebrate my heroes and my sheroes past and present. And for the remainder of this time, I'm going to be totally self indulgent. And I've got the mic, so I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to be totally self-indulgent as I want to invite you to walk with a personal hero of mine. I want you to listen to her voice. Go into your imagination. I want you to look through her lens, to step into her sandals. And we meet her in John's Gospel, Chapter 4, The Woman at the Well. Picture the scene. A woman, walking alone, making an all-too-familiar journey on the same old dusty road towards the same old well, same old, same old. We don't know her name, but let's not assume that just because a name isn't given, a title or credentials announced, that she's unimportant or insignificant. Let me introduce myself to you, since you only know me by my geographical label and location, a Samaritan woman, woman at the well. Oh well, better than some of the names I've been called in the past. Samaritan woman, that's me woman at the well. To be honest, life was a challenge and it felt like an ordeal. Some days I would grit my teeth and just about get by. Imagine all those daily journeys to the well. In the middle of the day, at the hottest point of the day, it's exhausting, it's depleting. You might be asking yourself the question, what is she doing? Alone, on your own, why aren't you with the community of other women, enjoying their company? After all, no one in their right mind would be out in the midday sun, don't you know? As if I didn't know that. Well, just for the record, I finally decided not to walk with them. I decided I was better off walking alone rather than having to put up with their snide remarks, the humiliations, the put-downs, the shaming, making me feel worthless, powerless to respond. So now you know why the solitary walk. And to be honest, I also needed the head and heart space 
to clear my thoughts, to gather my energy, to face daily living within my own community, the very community who had marginalized me, ostracized me. But let me focus on that day, that unforgettable day. It started out just like any other, but turned out to be, anyway, I'm just jumping ahead of myself. I arrive at the well, going through my usual routine, feeling a bit heavy hearted. I lifted up my head, absently adjusting my headscarf, which was by now slipping from my head because of the sweat that was coming through my head, when I shifted my gaze and I saw him. I saw him sitting at the well, a man. I was shocked. I didn't expect anyone else to be there. Who's he? What does he want? Was he going to take advantage of me? What to do? I couldn't turn back. He had seen me. He was looking at me, not in a threatening way or a lewd way. He was just looking. And there was something different in his gaze. There was an openness, a welcome, an invitation, an acceptance, no judgment. I can't tell you that this was an altogether new experience for me, for someone who is constantly having to be on alert at all times, second-guessing people's reactions and responses, someone who's always having to be vigilant. I stare back. I stare back at him in a moment of what felt like suspended animation. And I jolt back into the present. Gather yourself! So I gather my thoughts and I'm thinking, quick, think, get the water, leave. But he then speaks. He's addressing me, he's speaking to me, he's asking me for water. A Jewish man talking to a Samaritan, but not only to a Samaritan, but to a Samaritan woman. A woman, a woman. Look, I'm not over-egging this point. Believe me, I'm not. We're all familiar with the daily prayers that were said by the Jewish men. Thank you, God, for not making me a Gentile, a woman, or a slave. So imagine the scene. This man by the well, this teacher, this Jewish rabbi addressing, speaking to, conversing with, having a dialogue asking a Samaritan woman for water. Well, I thought, oh yeah, he's having a laugh, I thought. Perhaps he's got sunstroke, perhaps he's the one who's got sunstroke and suffering. Perhaps he's delirious. Anyway, what's he doing here at midday at the well? Here we are living in segregated conditions, Jew and Samaritan paths rarely ever cross, and he wants some water from these hands, from these hands with my DNA on it that would contaminate the vessel holding the water. And of course I get cynical and I think I bet he's after something else and it's not water. So I brace myself. I'm on alert, ready to defend. But I'm shocked out of my very sandals. Blow me down. He continues. He continues the conversation. He initiated the move. He reached out to me. He had a need, and his need was for water. And well, you know, the rest is history. But he spoke to me first. You can't imagine what that felt like. Being engaged in a conversation, not in a patronizing way as if he's doing me a favor by coming into my territory or speaking to me in a way that I'd never experienced. 
You know, for the first time in my life, I felt as if I was being treated like a human being. That I was visible, that I was being seen and valued and not being ostracized, othered, marginalized, or treated like an outcast. You just can't imagine what it feels like to be treated in this way, unless you're in my shoes. You can't imagine what it's like not to be treated as if you're not a mistake or a blip or insignificant. You can't imagine. But clearly, he knew I was an outcast, yet he engaged with me. He knew I had been ostracized by my community, yet he drew close having to fetch water alone without the customary group of women, he knew because it must have spoken volumes that my personal needs and circumstances drove me to the well at this time, the hottest part of the day. And I was certain, but I was certain, I thought he couldn't possibly know everything about me. But then he goes straight to the taboo subject. I know, I know you've been waiting for me to navigate this one. I know you have. You're, you're, you're just sitting there thinking, how did, how did you navigate that one? But you wouldn't be the first. You wouldn't be the first to think that. He mentions my husband's five, to be exact. And you know what? People are so keen to judge and point the finger and gossip, aren't they? But they constantly fail to appreciate the challenge faced by women in my culture, in my context. We were among one of the most marginalized in the community, still are. Five husbands, how did that happen? People get fixated on numbers. They get fixated on numbers. But no one ever pauses to question or consider that there may just be a backstory to this. People always like to go with a stereotype, but always like to prejudge and assume she's a man-eater, can't keep her hands off men. Mm -hmm all that nonsense. But no one ever pauses to ask the critical questions. What in a person's history brought them to this point of struggle? What happened in their social economic circumstances that locked them into their current state? No one asks the question, what is really going on here for her? Was there sickness? Was there disease? Was she widowed? And if so, bearing in mind the Levitical law, this inevitably meant I would have had to marry the next brother in line, have his children if necessary. You will understand this and appreciate the sheer practicality and necessity for such decisions. Because where else was the support going to come from? There's no inheritance for me, no pension pot. We women relied on the men for economic stability, for status and children. No human rights. No one ever asks, was there a forced marriage? Others were always so keen to remind me of my past, of my failures, my lack, my dishonor, my shame. Yet he, the man, at the well was keen to draw my attention into the present, to my humanity, to who I was becoming, to life and living. And I have to say, it was an unbelievable experience. Don't you wish you were there? For once in my life, I didn't feel labeled, at a disadvantage, got at less than, I felt that I could be fully me, be myself. No need to defend or justify my presence, my existence with this stranger. None of that. This man at the well. No apology. Nothing. What was it about this moment that was so significant? The reality was as that I was being acknowledged and seen and valued for who I was and who I could be myself. And what a gift that is to each one of us to be acknowledged and valued and seen for who we are and what we bring with our distinctives galore. 
This man at the well, he understood me. He understood my spiritual dilemmas, my questions. Somehow, remarkably, he really did get into my sandals. He really did step into my space. He got into my head, my heart, and understood how I saw things and where I was coming from, and yet was also able to help me, help me to see things differently. He helped me to see possibilities. He helped me to see a future in what couldn't have been more than a few minutes conversation. He knew I was searching for the truth, but like my people, I'd got stuck on the God of the mountain, Jerusalem, somewhere. I'd got caught up in misunderstanding, in the division and the enmity, perpetuating misinformation. But when this man at the well spoke, he spoke with such clarity and simplicity and authority. I was blown away. Suddenly, I could see. I could see things in a way that I'd never spoken before. The language he spoke was so clear. And do you know what? Just so that he could communicate with me, he used an everyday symbol. And what was the everyday symbol? Water. How amazing is that? How brilliant. I had never heard such truths explained to me in such a simple but incredibly profound way. And you know what? He took me seriously. He spoke to me about my people. And wait for it. We talked. Theology. 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 A rabbi talking to a woman about theology. Now we all know, don't we, that the sort of rabbinical schools in the synagogue were a boys only club. No girls allowed. But between you, me, and the gatepost, I have to confess that even I was impressed by my own answers and my insight. And I gave some sharp answers. You see, I never knew what I had in me. I suppose the potential was always there. The gifts were always there. The anointing was always there. But somehow it had been buried. I just couldn't see what I was holding. I couldn't see the gifts within. But my encounter with him, my conversation with him, enabled me to hear my own voice. For the first time, has that ever happened to you? It was remarkable. It was like having an out-of-body experience. He drew me, the potential in me, out of myself. I felt as if I was becoming more human, more whole, more myself. I could breathe. I could exhale deeply. And then I suddenly got it. I suppose this is what you would call my defining moment at the well midday. Somehow, through this encounter, I could see clearly. I could see clearly. There was an imp imperceptible, I don't even know what the words are. There was like an alignment occurring within. I can't fully explain it. But I suddenly saw how other people's put-downs, my cultural context, had distorted my perspective on life, had chained me into a place of resignation and limitation, thinking that this was my lot. It had changed me into living in an unbearable state of existence, which had trapped and imprisoned me in my own mind. And add to that my own internal scripts... What a recipe for hopelessness. But then the conversation continued. And again, just remember, it's only a short conversation. Was it something he said or was it something I said? Something about Messiah. Well, there was a moment when it all made sense. It was indescribable. Perhaps you can understand. Transforming, unlocking, releasing, intoxicating, life-giving. Was it heart or head? Both. I do not know. But I knew I could speak, and I could breathe, and I could stand, and it, I felt such an incredible sense of boldness. I know it sounds bonkers, but I felt the courage to speak, to be seen, again, to be heard. You know, remember, I'm the one who is crowd-averse. 
I go undercover all the time. In fact, I felt so confident, so excited, so courageous that guess what? Guess what? I ditched my water pot. I ditched my water pot and I ran back to the community, to the town, to tell the very people who had ostracized me, who had no time for me, who had marginalized me. I wanted to go and share my good news with them. I wanted to share the good news that I had received from this God-man by the well, by my encounter. And I didn't feel afraid. I was not afraid of other people's opinions of me. I just knew I had to do what I needed to do. But also, you know, let's, let's not forget and give credit where it's due. He also took a risk. Let's face it, he did, didn't he? He risked his honor, his reputation, credibility in order to communicate this life-giving message to me. Frankly, though, I don't think he was even bothered about what others thought of him. He was that kind of person. But also, I did pick up on a, th a few things. Don't think I didn't notice the awkward silence and the looks of disbelief on the faces of the disciples when they returned back from their shopping spree. They saw Jesus talking to a Samaritan, a Samaritan woman, talking theology. Can you imagine how the disciples would have felt on seeing this sight? After all, they had all their social and cultural biases and stereotypes and prejudices entrenched in them. And yet here was Jesus collapsing them all in one fail swoop. Don't you just love it? And do you know that this was the longest recorded conversation in the Gospels Jesus ever had with anyone? And it was with me, a woman. How blessed am I? Also, I was the first to hear him announce that he was the Messiah. What a privilege, what an honor. Back to Chester Cathedral. So there she is, my hero, and her early leadership journey. All it took was one encounter, one conversation with Jesus to transform the life of this incredible woman giving her a sense of purpose, defining her calling, giving her boldness, courage, pushing her beyond her own constraints and the limitations imposed on her by culture and community. But what scripture doesn't tell us is that this ordinary, extraordinary Samaritan woman is historically credited with evangelizing the whole region of Samaria. You see, she was a born leader. She just didn't know it see it or indeed recognize it. By the time Philip got to the region in the book of Acts, most of the Samaritans had become followers of Jesus. I wonder what happened there. Who was involved there? But let me tell you, she was also a first on a number of other fronts. The first evangelist recorded in the Gospels, the first female evangelist, and I'm going to throw this one in, she was a West Asian woman. I declare my biases freely. Just those words, Asian woman, isn't it sweet? And she has a name. After her baptism, she came to be known as Fatina, meaning the light bearer. And according to tradition within the Greek Orthodox community, she occupies a place of honor among their apostles known as Great Martyr St. Fatini, equal among the apostles. She's commemorated on the 26th of February with dates differing among the other Orthodox communities. And she's celebrated on the fourth Sunday after Lent, known as the Sunday of the Samaritan Woman. Fatini is also honored in Oaxaca, Mexico, by churches, schools, and businesses who give away fruit drinks to passers-by on Good Samaritan Day. Pots filled with fruit juice are decorated like wells, and there's a reenactment of the scene at the well outside churches where a blessing is offered before drinks are distributed. So finally, what happened to her? One story describes how after she was arrested, she was arrested and tortured by Nero, she was placed into the custody of his daughter, Domnina. Shortly afterwards, Domnina and all her servants became Christians. 
As you can imagine, her father was not best pleased. There are countless other amazing stories of Fatina's courage, miracles and activities as she travelled from Africa to Rome. But eventually we learn that her and her entire family paid the ultimate price and were martyred, ironically thrown down a well by Nero himself. All it took was one encounter. Jesus himself took the time to make a journey, to reach out, to express a personal need, to cross boundaries of geography, culture, ethnicity, gender, because he had to. But he made the effort. He took the time. He invested himself to reach out and invite her in. And like the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, my Asian sister, my encounter with Jesus was the most formative and foundational encounter in my life. And it informs my leadership and my calling. The critical decisions that I have made in my life and the encounters I've had with key individuals, groups and challenging circumstances have been both good, bad and inexplicable. My life has been defined by those defining moments to which I've chosen to respond. And I can only respond in the way that I can respond. So it's in a cham-shaped, God-sized way and seeking to do my part in God's purposes for his kingdom on earth. Thank you. Um, that was really delightful. Thank you very much for sharing something of your personal story. But also, wow, what a beautiful way you've brought John chapter 4 to life for us in the most wonderful way. Um, there are lots of, lots of sort of themes that came out of that, I think, about finding voice and acceptance and so forth and welcome and so forth. I, any questions at all that, that people would like to, to throw, throw out at this, this, this stage? Jeremy. Well, it's a help from this talk as we go into the lunch period because I was really impressed that you found, you were looking for how you could find, identify God in yourself. One of the images we have here is lent by Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkin, and it's in the cloister next to another image by, lent by Bishop Gulli Francis Dahani, the Bishop of Chelmsford, and Karen Lunt. They've all been put together, and the pictures are pictures that helped them be role models to find role models so they could be human, and they've got little um, QR codes that will tell you their stories. It's very, very powerful and exactly it was the first time that they found that they could be fully human in the, in the image of God. Do you have a particular person, um, other than the Samaritan at the well, who, by the way, we can show you at lunchtime, because we have her on permanent display in our garden here Wonderful. at the well, but do you have a particular person who's done that for you, or an image that perhaps we might be able to take up, other than what you've shared that has inspired me this morning? I, the people who have inspired me, you probably wouldn't know. You wouldn't know that, that there were people, friends who are still around me, um, who just impacted my life in incredible ways. I just felt the love of Jesus through what they said and what they did. Um, ordinary, extraordinary people. Um, I live in community with my best friend, um, and she releases the love of Jesus in incredible ways. Um, and she, she's um, an African sister, and I'm blessed that both our countries can come together and create some, some special stuff for the Christian community. Um, but the people you wouldn't know, but... Um, um, and people like Rose Hudson Wilkins, really inspired by her, 
and others who have pioneered and had to break ground um, to make it possible for people like myself to come forward. Um, I just thank God for them because it's not been easy. It's not been easy. It's, it's, and it continues to be a challenge. But my prayer and my hope is that somewhere along the line, someone will see a person like me coming from Smethwick. And I know I always go on about Smethwick, but it was such a toxic, toxic environment. And um, resources have always been um, held back from that community. And it's a miracle that I taught myself to read and write. Um, and some of you might think, well, actually, no, it isn't. But, you know, when you're a first who goes, who out of the village goes to the university, it, it's a huge thing. And it was not something that I took for granted. But I hope that somebody will be inspired by my story, because if I, coming out of my location with so many, without the privileges or the positions or the authority or the legitimacy behind me, um, in God's economy, um, I just love it when he flips things around right ways up. So in God's economy, all things are possible. And, and he releases he, heaven's resources towards us. So be encouraged is all I want to say. And let us all be role models to and image bearers of a living God to those we encounter. Any other questions, folks? Yep, Hawk. Uh, if somebody else wants to go, I don't mind, because I asked a question last time. But I, I loved the way that you helped us see the Samaritan woman through your eyes. Um, and you've opened a whole possibility in terms of our uh, engaging better around the, the, the world of race in my head I've never thought of before. Because I've always thought of anti-racism training as helping one to see another better. Um, you've opened the possibility in my mind of actually anti-racism training being helping us to see through another's eyes more clearly. Uh, that's probably not an original thought, but it's the first time I've had it. And I, I wonder whether you have any other links or any comments to make on that, because I just found it a very helpful insight. So thank you. I think um, I'm not going to do a plug, but we design programs and we, we design something around collaborative leadership and that sort of factors into anti-racism and all that narrative. But we like to take people on a journey because unless we go on the journey and we walk with each other and we step into the shoes of others and we learn the, the knowledge stuff, but knowledge alone will not get us there. There's something that there has to be a connection between the mind and the heart, and then a revolution occurs, and that's where a repentance occurs, and that's when something quite transformative occurs. Um, so, uh, you know, I can read as much as I can read, but I need to do the journey with others. And, and there's something there about humility as well, accept, accepting that actually that there's a position that I need to take because I don't know. But, but I invite people to ask me questions. I invite people to, if you don't know, that's okay. But do find out because there are some incredible books, as Shamil has already shown, um, out there that can inform us better. You know, and you know, if the church, if as followers of Jesus, we cannot bust the sin of racism, no one else can. It is simple as that. If we cannot be um, having those conversations, then nobody, nobody else can. And we sh the reality is we should be on the front foot. We have heaven's resources, we have scripture before us, we have Jesus as our role model. What more do we want? You know, what, what more do we want? Uh, we need to get up there and get out there and, um, and yeah, look at the collaborative leadership that we've done. But we, um, we don't do um, half a day training, for example, um, or an hour's training on, on diversity. That's, in my perspective, that's a tick box exercise. But if people come to us and say, actually, Chan, we want to do a journey. I've got time for you. 
I have got time to give to you because I know you're serious about changing structures and systems because until the structures change, until we as a church invest in changing the structures, investing in people who have been uh, marginalised, who lack privilege um, and legitimacy, uh, nothing's going to shift. We just need to look at the Gospels, look at Jesus, look at what he did with the Samaritan woman and others and gave them life. Change makers, that's who we are. We already have that mandate. It's, it's weighing on us. Let's, let's just do something really uh, revolutionary, dare I say. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Can I just say something about hospitality? Um, I was struck by the, what you said right at the start, where you talked a little bit about um, your sort of cultural experience of going into church and uh, the weak tea and the dry biscuits and yeah. um, you know the carpet on the on the pews and this is kind of part of who much many of us, the, the, the experience that many of us sort of take for granted and it's when people come in from the outside that actually they break through the uh, uh, the norms of what we've come to expect and then you come tell us the, lo- that lovely, the, the lovely story in the most beautiful way about Jesus and uh, again it's, it, there's, there's a hospitality there isn't there both, from both of them yeah. to be honest yeah. um, and I just feel that, that somehow we've got ho- our, our, our offer of hospitality wrong here I don't know. How, can you, can, what do we do to get to, to get that get better at it? Is is, is a question I, I I don't yet have the answer to, but I don't know whether you have any thoughts thoughts about that. We. What can I say? Um, and it's not a criticism. You know, that was just my experience in terms of. Criticism. It's oh, most, okay. most of our experience. I think that's, that's the truth. You know, when, when I read scripture and, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, there's a constant theme of hospitality and generosity and welcome, welcoming the stranger. And, and I, 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 perhaps we don't teach that often enough. You know, we have a God of hospitality, a God of welcome. You know, the foreigner, the stranger, um, the widow, the orphan, um, people who are very different to us. Um, and I would just say, let's just get some quick wins in. You know, perhaps when you're next at church, um, you see somebody who doesn't look like you, um, invite them out for a coffee. Um, because for some people, that level of um, the Godwara scene is another level. Langar is another level. Um, you know, we've been practicing it where we have vats of food, um, and, and that takes a certain operation. But you can do some quick wins. Coffee, um, cake. I do like a cake. And, um, and, and just begin to extend yourself in those ways. And if someone offer, invites you into their home, and um, learn, learn from that experience. And it's not that you, you're not aware of it or that we don't know it. We just, um, we're very private um, and things are very nuclear and behind closed doors and I think there's something here about fellowship, community, extending, extended families Um, because for example let me just say this that um, when my family heard that I was a follower of Jesus and there were implications for that um, for any convert who says yes to Jesus there are implications and many of us get cut off from family and community so the family therefore by natural extension would be you folks, for me, um, if I have no other family. Um, but sometimes that gets removed. And it's just remembering, you know, we want people to come to know Jesus, have, an, have a, a relationship with him, but there's a cost to discipleship. It's, it's, a, it's a well-known word and title and all the rest of it, but there is a cost to discipleship, particularly when you're a convert. So we also need to pay attention to what we can do to offer community and family and hospitality to those who've taken that huge step. 
Um, there's an uh, Asian theologian, Sugith Raja, convert, says yes to following Jesus. There are implications, and it's like having um, with their family, and he described it as having a major artery severed when, because your family cut you off. So then where do we go for our resource? Shamil wanted to say something. Shamil. I just cannot n not say it because we are sitting straight in front of that image of Trinity, Abraham's hospitality. And it's believed that this little square that you can see underneath was a mirror inviting the people who are watching into the Trinity itself. The hospitalities of God is just visible there. God is in hospitality, sitting at the table, but we are also invited into that perichoresis where it's a self-giving identity and knowing each other. So I think, thank you. That's, that's what I just want to add. Hospitality is the key. Thank you. Absolutely. We're called to be the hosts. We're called to be the welcomers. Um, we are called to extend our tables and invite people around the tables. If our tables are surrounded by people who look like us and sound like us, we've got to flip the tables. Jesus did that. Um, flip the tables and invite, invite others around who don't so sound like you, look like you, and perhaps don't even eat food in the way that you do. Some of us use these. <laughs> Chairman, thank you very much. Oh, I've got one more. Yep. Thank you. I was touched in your life story how you were talking about how uh, you went to the church for literacy support. And I'm wondering today, with the issues with education and maybe some of the um, difficulties of um, people from ethnic minorities not being, you know, very good at catching up with their education whether there's a role for our church in offering more literacy support to the community. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite... Would, is there a role for the church in, in offering literacy support to those who uh, uh, perhaps don't... English is not their, their first language, perhaps, or uh, uh, perhaps they haven't had the, the opportunities educationally that, that, that might help? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I... Um, my history in terms of churches, you know, uh, and, and the schools that they offered, it, stuff started there in terms of education, absolutely. Um, how great it would be if you can provide somebody with a tool so that they can articulate what they need to express for themselves. Let's upskill, let's be generous, you know, um, in terms of uh, providing resources. We can do that. That's a quick win and it will open up conversation, relationships, cross boundaries, borders, and you know, as long as we have our good spaces, safe spaces, where people can come and feel that they are at home and that we're not just giving them a service or we're being do-gooders um, so that they feel um, in some way indebted. We're just being Jesus. We're just being God. We're just being the image and, and just wanted to release that love and that resource to people and then leave the rest to God. Cham, thank you so much. Uh, it's been lovely to hear, hear you, lovely to hear your story, but also to hear your passion as well come through the, the, uh, the, 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 the woman at the well story. Uh, it, it's, it's been really delightful. Uh, I do, I, I resonated with so much of what you said, not least the fact that I can remember that picture of Jesus as the blonde shepherd boy with the, shepherd, the sheep around his, his shoulders that was on my grand's wall as well. So there you go. Uh, I think we should uh, give her a clap, don't you think? Thank you very much. Uh, folks, it's lunchtime. Um, the, for those of you who've ordered your sandwiches, they'll be in the chapter house, uh, I hope, uh, when you get there. And uh, so do please, it won't be quite the, 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 the food uh, uh, mountain, that the, the, the wonderfully sounding food mountain that Cham described, but uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll be okay. Um, We've got, we've got a bit of time because there's going to be an organ recital in the cathedral through the lunch break, which starts at ten past one. You're very welcome to come and listen and be a part of that as well. Uh, but we'll start again at two o'clock. And so for those of you who are watching on YouTube, do, uh, the, the, uh, the broadcast will stop over lunch, but we'll be back here at two o'clock. So do please come and join us again. So 
you've got free time now. There's the cathedral to look at, the exhibition. Chester, of course, as well, is just on your doorstep. But if you can be back here for 2 o'clock, that would be really, really good. Thank you very much.